are able to see my slides? Yeah. So at the outset, I'd like to thank um, Alargan, uh, AOS, and Dr. Ranamrita for giving me this wonderful opportunity. So coming about talking about infectious keratitis, why is it very important? Because it rarely occurs in normal eyes because of the human cornea's natural resistance to infection. So there are 3,000 cases, 30,000 cases were annually reported in the US uh, with a mixture of bacterial, fungal, and acanthin liver, which is published in AGO in 1992. Whereas in India, the, uh, the, it is around 84, 8,40,000. And 2 million ulcers in India alone. So you can see the magnitude of the problem in India as such. And uh, a study done by the Asia uh, Cornea Society for Infectious Keratitis Study showed that out of 6,626 eyes in a multi center study, they had about 38% were bacterial keratitis and 37% um, uh, were uh, fungal keratitis, and the rest were mixed infections. So this go goes to show the magnitude of the problem that we are facing today. So looking at what could be the causes, let's discuss ex exogenous factors first. So the patient could be using a contact lens, there could be history of trauma or previous ocular surgery, the presence of loose sutures and previous refractive surgery, medication related uh, such as contaminated ocular medication, use of uh, topical NSAIDs and anesthetics, uh, immunosuppression, and so some of these ex exogenous causes. Uh, risk factors as far as ocular surface disease is concerned is uh, misdirected eyelashes, poor lid uh, closure, teofilm deficiencies, adjacent infections such as conjunctivitis, gonococcal uh, conjunctivitis in children, blophilitis, mabomitis, dacrocystitis, etc. Corneal epithelial abnormalities such as neurotrophic keratopathy, uh, recurrent viral keratitis, recurrent corneal erosions, Corneal epithelial edema, such as bullous keratopathy, could be a predisposing causes for infectious keratitis. The systemic conditions are uh, diabetes mellitus, patients in ICU, collagen vascular disorder, substance abuse, dermatological conditions, Steven Johnson syndrome, OCP, immunosuppressive status, and vitamin E deficiency are some of the systemic factors which can predispose to uh, an infection. The common etiological agents which have been listed by the AO preferred practice pattern shows that predominantly the organism uh, is a pseudomonas aeruginosa, comes as a predominant organism followed by coagulase negative staphylococci. So when you come across a, an ulcer, the initial assessment would consist of taking a very detailed history, uh, like going into what the patient uh, came with, with how, how quick the symptoms were, whether it was acute or it's been a chronic problem, whether the patient has been on contact links where, or he's already had exposure to uh, vegetable matter or some of the other problems which you've already, uh, um, I had, uh, already mentioned. So once you uh, take a very detailed history, do a general examination, find out if the patient's uh, the skin condition, whether he has any systemic evidence of uh, um, immunological disease like rheumatoid arthritis, look at the conjunctival lacrimal apparatus, the corneal sensation, also, the slit lamp uh, biomicroscopy should not only include the cornea, but also you have to look for lid closure, conjunctiva, the presence of cells in the anterior chamber and the anterior vitreous, and also look at the sclera for any involvement. So clinical diagnosis can be made. Once you look at the uh, slit lamp, you can make an empirical diagnosis, whether it's bacterial, viral, or fungal, based on the clinical characteristics of the uh, uh, ulcer. Typically, a fungal ulcer has a dry, raised slough, it's got feathery edges. There could be satellite lesions and hyperpion. But it's a, uh, just the opposite. It's a wet and separative lesion with a lot of mucopurulent discharge. Could be a pseudomonas ulcer. And uh, an ulcer which has got a creeping edge and a dense infiltrate with a lead, uh, along the leading edge of the ulcer with a hyperpion could be a pneumococcal infection. And uh, it's important to stain in some instances where the patient is complaining of irritation, but you won't see anything. Then you can look, you can get the dendrites which could be a case of uh, HSP keratitis. So once you've seen, you've made an empirical diagnosis, it's important to document what you've seen. Either you can do color-coded diagrams and you have to uh, mark the area of the infiltrate, the amount of epithelial defect and the presence of any endothelial plaques, hyperprion and so on. Uh, and you can do an ASOCT so that you can find out the dimensions, the depth of the edema, the depth of the stromal cells, and also you can use a slit lamp uh, to, uh, to measure the, the extension of the ulcer. 
look for immune ring and so on. Photographic documentation is also very important. Both front and slit views can be taken uh, along with the color coded diagrams and precise measurement uh, helps us to, uh, uh, to follow up these patients uh, more accurately. So using the slit lamp, uh, slit beam ruler also helps in accurately measuring these uh, infections. So once you've done that, then you go into microbiology. Microbiology is probably the mainstay for management of these corneal uh, ulcers. And corneal scraping and stain can be done by uh, any uh, outpatient clinic because they don't involve much of microbiology work. A smear for glass lights for uh, grams, KOH pounds, and gene cell stains can be done. done. It's better to, uh, it's important that we remove the, um, uh, the, uh, the, the scraping is done at the edge of the ulcer. That's very important because that's where the maximum bacteria is present or the micro microbes are present. If you want to uh, scrape the base of the ulcer, first remove the exudates from the uh, base of the ulcer and then uh, uh, scrape the base of the ulcer for, uh, for uh, getting um, uh, material or, or the infectious material. And if you have a slightly more advanced microbiology lab, you can use culture plates such as blood agar, chocolate agar, uh, subgods uh, medium, NN agar with uh, E. coli overlay if you're suspecting acanthamoeba, LG medium for atypical microbacteria, and so on. So microbiology is essential uh, wherever we are, whether it's a very small clinic or a slightly more uh, uh, advanced setup where you can have uh, additional uh, investigations done. Why is corneal scraping important? Because the patient history and clinical appearance can make us give an empirical diagnosis. However, corneal stains and cultures helps to identify the organism we are dealing with. Also, the antibiogram allows us to tailor the treatment based on sensitivity of the organism. So it will help us to uh, be very sure about the treatment that we are giving and also uh, monitor the progress. So negative smears, uh, yes, negative smears is a problem. If you get negative smears, what do you do? If it's a, uh, uh, if you're sure about the diagnosis that's a bacterial ulcer, you can go ahead with an empirical antibiotic treatment, but the best thing would be to re-scrape and make sure that uh, the, the scraping, the, the, the avoid some of the common mistakes like poor staining uh, techniques, insufficient uh, samples or excessive heat fixation and so on. Or the patient is already on antimicrobial agents, it's better to stop the uh, uh, antibiotics at least 24 hours and do the re-scraping. Negative cultures are again a problem when you, uh, you, you have scraped and you have not got anything and then you have not got anything in culture. You have to again uh, stop the antibiotic and uh, re-scrape and, until you get uh, some idea about what type of organism you are dealing with. In some cases, PCR has an advantage because you can get it faster than the uh, culture in about four hours. But however, the disadvantages include the cost and the uh, false uh, positivity. So in patients where uh, there is lack of, lack of response uh, and you get more than one negative culture, you can do a corneal biopsy. Biopsy, which involves the, both, the, uh, both the involved and non-involved portion of the cornea is important. And uh, in patients with deep stromal infiltrate, you can use either a skin biopsy punch or you can use a leaven number blade and uh, go a little bit deeper to get some amount of the uh, involved tissue. You can do a flap and uh, over the uh, normal cornea and uh, approach the area of infection um, uh, so that you can get uh, some sample for uh, culture as well as for stain. So the goal of treatment is uh, eliminate the causative agent, suppress the inflammatory response, restore normal structure and function, and to relieve pain. So you once you made the clinical diagnosis and performed the appropriate lab procedures, you can initiate antimicrobial therapy. The therapy is modified based on the response, and then it's terminated once the com uh, ulcer completely heals. When a single dose, uh, a single drug therapy given, the commonest drugs that we use are uh, fluoroquinolones, the, um, now the fourth generation fluoroquinolones like moxifloxin, gatifloxin can be given as a single drug therapy, particularly in very small lesions where uh, you don't have to scrape. For example, the, using the rule of two, when it is less than two millimeter in diameter, when the cells in the anterior chamber are less than two, uh, two plus, or and when the, it's away from the visual axis beyond two millimeters, you can try single drug therapy. And, but uh, if, it is, uh, uh, in, if it is increasing in size, definitely you might have to stop the antibiotic and do the scraping. The concerns with single drug therapy, in particular in severe keratitis, are that it may not respond to treatment and the increased risk of perforation. So you need combination of fortified antibiotic and some, in some cases, even a systemic therapy may be required. 
So combination of fortified antibiotic, um, particularly in patients not responsive to single drug therapy, and patients where the systemic infection is extending to the sclera or there is an impending or frank perforation, and patients with gonococcal keratitis, that is uh, uh, patients with uh, children, neonate, uh, neonates with gonococcal keratitis need systemic uh, treatment. So when you're starting treatment, loading dose is important to uh, get the maximum inhibitory concentration. So one drop every one minute for five minutes, followed by every five minutes for 15 minutes. And then the treatment regimen would be 15 to 30 minutes round the clock. The reason being the largest increase in bacterial population occurs in the first one to two days of a stromal infection. So it's important that you uh, maximize the amount of uh, antibiotics that are uh, uh, instilled into the eye. And once there is a, a response, then the, 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 uh, the antibiotics can be tapered down. So the reason why uh, uh, we use to, uh, in case of uh, using two antibiotics, you have to have a staggered dosing because uh, the tears are replaced every five minutes, at least give a gap of five to 10 minutes between the drops. And once you've, uh, you've reduced the dosage, you can go even alternate, uh, alternate uh, hour. So inpatient treatment may be required for pediatric patients, one-eyed patients, fulmin and keratitis, patients in which visual access is threatened or impending perforation, patients who are uh, unable to commute daily or have poor compliance, you need to monitor them much more closely so inpatient treatment may be required. So once you have made the decision of a microbial keratitis, you also have to rule out any underlying immune ulcer or presence of any endophthalmitis or sterile ulceration. Once again, look at the risk factors that could be causing this, like lacrimal sac, little lash problems, presence of tear deficiency status, ocular surface disease like Steven Johnson's, neurotrophy, systemic illness, any presence of any prior treatment, particularly usage of steroids and the compliance of the patients. So the treatment overview would be an antimicrobial therapy, which we've already discussed, cyclopegics, IOP lowering medications in uh, very large ulcers with a lot of hypopion and uh, anti-chamber reaction painkillers, lubricants, and control of comorbidities like diabetes, dark glasses, anticollagenase, uh, and so on. So uh, how do you look at the positive response? When there is a reduction in pain, reduction in discharge, reduction in the conjunctive in uh, injection, reduced density of the stromal infiltrate, stromal edema, consolidation and sharper demarcation of the uh, perimeter of the stromal infiltrate, reduced anti-chamber reaction, reduced fibrin and hypopion, an initial rehabilitation, then you can uh, reassure yourself that the patient is responding to the therapy that you have given. So if the patient is getting better and the isolator is sensitive, the tape, then you can start tapering the antibiotic. If the isolator is not sensitive, then you have to additionally maybe have a fortified antibiotic. If the condition becomes worse, then uh, isolator is not sensitive, you change the antibiotic. If the isolator is sensitive, you have to look for other causes some of the comorbidities like um, uh, diabetes, et cetera. So tapering therapy, it's important. Probably this is not the right word to use when you are uh, dealing with an antibiotic, but once you see a good clinical response, you can reduce an, uh, the, the dosing of the antibiotic to hourly. You mean, uh, when you're using two antibiotics, they can be uh, used alternate hour. And after one week, probably you can reduce it down to four to six hours. A typical duration of treatment would be about three to four weeks. So re is not necessarily a complete endpoint of treatment because in spite of infection, the epithelium can uh, actually uh, heal. So it's important that we uh, take a look at that, particularly in fungal infections. In some cases, repeat scraping have to be done so that the drug penetration is better. So caveats in treatment are microbiological diagnosis is essential. Long duration of treatment has to be counseled to the patient. Epithelial debridement will be helpful, particularly in fungistatic preparations where the penetration of the drug is poor. And so repeated scraping at least once in two days will help uh, the ulcer heal better. The drug combinations, you have to look at drug combinations which are controversial, which may actually hinder each other. And patients who are on parental drugs like uh, antifungals monitor liver function. And looking at steroids, steroids, um, there's a saying by Sosbury said, which makes two useful agents into one bad compound. However, steroids have been used in uh, the treatment of, of uh, corneal ulcers and there are a lot of studies showing the benefits. So uh, when do we use steroids? And never before diagnosis. Once you've made the, uh, the diagnosis of infective keratitis uh, and you're very sure about the antibiotic response, then you can use it. But if you use it before, 
there's a greater chance of antibiotic failure and so it cannot be misused. Patients with uh, uh, who are already on steroids who have shown uh, redu uh, reduced corneal inflammation once the antibiotics have been started to resolve the corneal inflammation further and facilitate stromal healing to minimize necrosis, particularly in gram-negative infections and improve chances of clear graft after therapeutic PK, you can use steroids uh, judiciously. So in patients with impending perforations, fungal keratitis, acanthamoeba keratitis, it is totally contraindicated. So cortical steroid therapy should be minimal just to, uh, uh, just to achieve control of inflammation. It should be optimal. It should be dosed along with antibiotics. It should be adequate and appropriate. And uh, there should be a close follow of patients on steroids. And IOP monitoring is very essential. These are some of the patients who have undergone um, treatment at our hospital. This is showing a patient with gram positive coca in a, a suture abscess. The usual drug of choice for gram positive coca is fourth and third generation fluoroconolones with fortified cephalosporins. This is a patient with gram negative uh, infection to a uh, growing pseudomonas in the culture who did very well with tobramycin and fortified septicidin. A patient who had a low grade chronic endophthalmitis following DSEC had antifungal treatment and also had a vitrectomy. You can see candida albicans growing in the culture. I'm sorry, I think it's going back. Okay, so the, looking at acanthibiba, there are two, uh, this is a, a very uh, typical condition where the patient, patient has more symptoms than signs, and typically patient has radial keratoneuritis, and you can see it uh, classically in uh, some very early cases. And there are two groups of drugs uh, which are commonly used, uh, uh, the diamidines and biguanides. And uh, of, of the two, I think biguanides and chlorhexidine has been a PHMB, has shown the maximum response. Uh, in the recent years, we've started using voriconazole with excellent results. And milchiposin is also a new uh, biguanide which has gone, shown very good response uh, along with PHMB. So no cardiac keratitis, fortified amikacin is a drug of choice along with cefcolin, and you can systemic and topical sulfonamides uh, uh, can also be added. In patients with post lasic infection, the commonest cause is um, atypical mycobacteria, and they do very well with amikacin and antitubercles treatment. So again, when you're dealing with very small ulcers, less than two millimeters, you can go for a broad spectrum antibiotic. Large bacterial ulcers with negative stain, you can start empirical antibiotic and repeat culture if the patient is not responding. However, in case of fungal ulcers and acanthibomic keratitis, a negative uh, smear is considered of significant value and empirical antifungals cannot be started. So you have, if you still suspect uh, antifungal, uh, then you have to repeat the scraping. And rescraping is done after stopping antibiotics or anti uh, uh, any uh, mode of treatment 24 hours uh, 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 to confirm the diagnosis. If the patient is not responding and this has a recalcitrant ulcer, you should have a strong suspicion of rare organisms, such as pythium and uh, acanthamoeba. In non-responsive ulcers, which are extending to the periphery, it's better to do a therapeutic keratoplasty and send it for microbiology workup. So the surgical modalities are superficial keratectomy, corneal biopsy, glue and BCL in impending perforations or perforated corneal ulcers, therapeutic uh, penetrating keratoplasty, Conjunctival flaps or Gunderson's flap helps in patients who have non-responding corneal ulcers. And tarsoraphy and uh, lateral tarsoraphy should be done in these patients. And sac and lid surgery should also be contemplated with this presence of dactrocystitis and non-responsive ulcers. This is one of our patients who had a zonomonas corneal ulcer with a contact lens, underwent a TPK, and you can see that the clarity of the graft over a period of uh, uh, 15 days, and she did very well. So in the management of microbial keratitis, there's no magic bullet. Stepwise approach is very essential. Microbiology is uh, uh, one of the most important uh, factors that's going to help us to uh, plan the treatment also to follow up the patient. And look at the trends of uh, drug resistance uh, um, so, to, so that you can manage the case more effectively. Use appropriate therapy based on the type of organism you're dealing with. Ensure that the patient is compliant. If the patient is uh, compliant, it is coming for follow-up regularly. And the surgical facilities are important. You cannot able to manage them medically. Overall, the outcomes, if you follow these simple steps, they're quite encouraging and they've given excellent results. Thank you.
Thank you so much, Sujata. I think uh, it was a vast topic which you co covered very concisely and precisely. Very difficult to, you know, uh, do with the whole gamut of microbial keratitis. We do have uh, questions, uh, Sujata. I think uh, we'll take.